Okay, uh, our time as always is uh, precious, so I want to make sure we don't uh, do an injustice to everybody who's here on time. I suspect more people will filter in as we go. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is a, uh, a program jointly sponsored by the Medical Humanities Program here at IUPUI and the Spirit of Medicine Program, which is an IU Health Values Fund program, a funded program to foster discussions primarily among medical students about the intersection between spirituality and health. I want to make a couple of uh, housekeeping remarks. First, this lecture is being recorded and will be broadcast at six different locations around IU Health. Uh, I just want to thank those other organizations, including IU Health Ball Memorial, IU Health Saxony, IU Health Arnett, IU Health West, IU Health North, and IU Health Methodist Hospital. If, if that organization keeps growing at the current pace, we won't need to acknowledge uh, other centers. They'll all be IU Health in the not too distant future. And finally, please silence your pagers and cell phones. No need to turn them off, but we just don't want our terrific lecture to be interrupted by uh, extraneous noises. And uh, we had a terrific discussion last night at our uh, Spirit of Medicine meeting. Again, it's a group of about 18 medical students. And uh, our text for the evening was the Gospel of Luke. Some of our prior texts have included Albert Camus' The Plague, the Book of Job from the Bible, Leo Tolstoy's short story, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. In January, we actually watched and discussed the film The Exorcist. So that gives you a bit of a sense of how eclectic our readings and discussions are, but they're all focused, you know, at the intersection of spirituality and health. And today we have one of the very most thoughtful and highly regarded people there is anywhere uh, on this very intersection. He's Dr. Daniel Solmazy, who's the Kilbride Clinton Professor of Medicine and Ethics in the Department of Medicine and then in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. And he has just an extraordinary academic pedigree and serves in a variety of capacities as, uh, as a scholar, as a teacher, as a clinician, you have access to his more detailed biographical information. I don't want to uh, use up any of our precious time rehearsing that, but that information is readily accessible to you, and I'd encourage you to make yourself uh, familiar with it. But without any further ado, I think we should lock, uh, launch into what I find a very intriguing title, Spirituality and End of Life. Lessons from Fred. I'm very eager to find out who Fred is and what Fred might teach us. So let's give a warm Indiana University welcome to Dr. Dan Somazi. Well, thank you very much for uh, that uh, gracious introduction. Thanks for inviting me. It is uh, good to be here, and thanks for the warm uh, Indiana University welcome. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to start with a few caveats. I know this is co-sponsored by uh, the ethics group, but, but this really is um, more a spirituality uh, talk than it is an, uh, an ethics talk. Um, and um, it's an exercise, I would say, in spirituality rather than being a talk about um, spirituality. Um, and in particular, it's about the spirituality of being a healthcare professional rather than the spirituality of being a patient and coping uh, with illness. Um, uh, I'll also tell you that it's necessarily going to be personal because I think that um, spirituality is ultimately person, uh, personal because it's only persons who can uh, wonder, um, love, um, uh, pray, um, and serve. Um, and it'll be, in that sense, very particular um, because it's about me, um, as much as it's about Fred, um, it's going to be using language that's particularly um, Christian, Catholic, and, uh, and Franciscan. Um, and just to let you know that ahead of time, um, my um, view about these kinds of discussions is it's best if you want to get to the depth of 
um, a spiritual experience from somebody, to let a Jew speak as a Jew, a Buddhist speak as a Buddhist, a Christian as a Christian, um, in the hope that when we get to that level, there are resonances which are meaningful for people across um, all traditions. And that the alternative of trying to make something that um, is um, so bland that it doesn't offend anybody winds up um, actually being um, uh, of, of little uh, uh, consequence to anyone and, and probably not the best way to go. Um, so with all that said as warnings before we, <laughs> before we start, um, what I'm going to do for the next uh, 45 minutes or so is tell you a story. Um, and the only other thing I'll tell you, since it is an ethics, uh, co-sponsored by ethics, is that the names have been changed um, um, in, uh, in doing this. In the end, I would fail him. It was as inevitable as the rain. I knew it from the beginning. See, I was the ethicist on call for the second week of November. A nurse called and said uh, that a patient wanted help with an advanced directive, and uh, I waited till the end of the day after attending to emails and editing, and then I trudged over to the hospital uh, to the cardiac step-down unit. Not too many requests for living wills here, I thought to myself, knowing that most cardiologists didn't actually believe their patients ever died of heart disease, only that they sometimes might succumb to comorbidities like diabetes or else they simply died when the code was called. And in the latter case, it wouldn't be heart disease, but rather a failure of technology that did them in. In any event, it was just plain unusual to have a patient in a cardiac floor want to fill out an advance directive. Otherwise, a routine request, I thought to myself, uh, I would take a few minutes to explain the difference between a living will and a durable power of attorney for health care, recommending that the patient execute the proxy uh, document and letting him know why, and then I'd leave them with some blank forms and be on my way. Usually in our hospital, this sort of task is delegated to our patient representatives. Um, sometimes, however, patients insist that it must be the ethicist with whom they speak, and I'm happy to serve if that's the patient's request. Um, in fact, I had done the same for a patient in the medical intensive care unit the week before. You know, not like a full-blown ethics consult with some dilemma or disagreement or some other naughty problem. The request seemed so routine that I didn't even bother to look at the patient's chart before I entered the room. Mr. Now, Mr. Fred Finnerty, I inquired. He nodded his head. He looked a bit disheveled. He was obviously frightened. He was 64 years old, on the short side, a bit overweight, mostly bald, with a snow-white, untrimmed beard. The places where the razor should have cut his face back to the bare skin were peppered with a gritty white stubble. His voice was unpleasant to hear. A strong New York accent combined with a sort of whiny lilt. I know who you are, he said. You're that Dr. Sal Macy. I met you after a lecture six months, months ago, remember? We invited you to talk to our chapter of the Sarah Club, you know, that group that promotes vocations to the priesthood. I had only the vaguest recollection. Oh, yes, I remember. Good, good, good to meet you again. I understand you want help filling out an advance directive. I got lung cancer, you know. Uh, no, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't look at your chart. Would you be my doctor? Ex excuse me? I heard you lecture, and I said to myself, if I'm ever really sick, I want that Sal Macy. He spoke so earnestly that his head leaned forward on his neck and his eyes seemed to strain forward out of his skull, each held in place by its optic nerve the way a leash holds a dog in place upon meeting another dog. But, but you have other doctors caring for you now, don't you? Yeah, but they're for the cancer and my atrial fibrillation. I need a regular doctor. I know I can't be cured, but I need a doctor for when things get bad. I don't want no feeding tube or nothing, and I'm a Catholic. 
I don't want somebody telling me I got to have one, and I trust you. Now, this is uh, one of the problems that accompanies the giving of public lectures. Now, <laughs> if you sound sincere, people believe you. Now, they might even believe in you. And if they do, this forces you either to try to live up to their expectations or avoid getting involved. Sane people avoid such situations. Doctors, known for their outsized egos, climb right up onto the pedestal and pose. Sure, I'll be your doctor. Let me go back to the nursing station, read over your chart, come back and talk to you and examine you. That's how it began. He had metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. He'd been diagnosed in September and it was now November. He was receiving Tarceva, a relatively mild anti-cancer drug with some activity against lung cancer. He was also undergoing radiation treatment to a painful bony metastasis in his right shoulder. He was admitted with fever, cough, possible pneumonia. His blood was also very thin, a consequence of an interaction between the Tarceva and the medicine he was taking to prevent the blood clots and strokes that were associated with atrial fibrillation, the disturbance in his heart rhythm. I'm gay, you know, he said as I was listening to his lungs. And I'm an alcoholic, but I go to meetings. I've been sober for 25 years. I'm a friend of Bill's, you know. One day at a time, I said. Yeah, he replied. Now take a deep breath in while I examine your belly. I know a lot of priests. Oh, oh really, where from, AA? <laughs> <laughs> you know you can't ask me that. <laughs> His heart had been beating too quickly when he was admitted. The cardiologists were giving him medications to slow his heart rate, but one of the side effects was to lower his blood pressure. He couldn't stand up without becoming dizzy. Complicating matters, he was having side effects from the Tarceva, a rash and diarrhea. The diarrhea had caused him to lose large amounts of body fluid, making his blood pressure even lower. A couple of liters of normal saline intravenously did the trick. His blood pressure came up, his heart rate went down, and after a week in the hospital, he could finally go home. When I saw him in the office five days later, he wasn't doing well. His blood pressure was still lower than I wanted it to be, and his heart rate still too high. He was nauseated from the Tarceva and still having diarrhea, and I tried to get him to take in more salt, soups, crackers, pretzels. You know, you've got to keep up your fluids, I warned him. He was also short of breath when he tried to walk. His oncologist blamed it on his heart. I thought it was all the nodules of cancer in his lungs. The oncologist also thought the Tarceva might be helping him. Having looked at Mr. Finnerty's x-rays, I found this hard to, uh, to believe. Sometimes I wonder who is more likely to be in denial, cancer patients or their oncologists. Here's my health care proxy form, said Fred. I named Fada O'Malley. He's a good friend. Thanks, I said, and put a copy in the chart. If we need it now, we know where to look. I want to go to St. Clair's Hospice when my time comes. I don't like that Mount Carmel. Uh, they weren't nice to a friend of mine. He wanted to go out on passes, and they wouldn't let him. They were like the nuns in my grammar school. So much attention to law and order, they lose sight of the big picture. Okay, Mr. Finnerty, but I understand it takes a long time to get into St. Clair's. They're always running full, and there's a long waiting list. I can wait. I do live alone, but I cashed in my life insurance, and I can use my IRA. I got aides coming to the house, and I can get them round the clock if I need them. The nurses come two days a week, and the physical therapist three times. Uh, I think it would be easiest just to stick with the nursing, uh, home nursing service till a bed opens up. But if the list is long, why don't you just put me on it now? Well, I said, let's wait and see what the oncologists say about the Tarceva. You know, it may stabilize your disease and give you more time. And we need to say that you have six months um, or less to get you into hospice. Actually, I believed he was already eligible for hospice, but this was the first patient I had cared for being treated with Tarceva. 
I didn't want to challenge the oncologist with my limited knowledge and experience, and I didn't want to undermine the oncologist's message to the patient. Not only did I say what I did to protect the patient from a dispute among his doctors, but also because, in fact, I was an interloper. The patient had brought me in to his care right under the nose of the oncologist. The oncologist might be worried that the ethicist was stealing the patient away from anti-neoplastic treatment into the world of palliation. So I decided I would just parrot the oncologist's line about needing to wait a few more weeks to do a CT PET scan to see if the Tarsiva was working. Two days later, he saw the oncologist who immediately admitted him to the hospital. The nausea and the vomiting about which he had complained to me had only worsened. He had become dehydrated again and had nearly fainted. His blood pressure remained too low, his heart rate too high. The Tarsiva was stopped and he received intravenous saline once more. His nausea dissipated and his blood pressure came up. We discharged him home on a lower dose of Tarsiva to see if he could tolerate it better. But two weeks later, in the face of more nausea and diarrhea, it became clear that he wasn't tolerating the drug at any dose. I decided he was now really too sick to see me in the office, so I'd start making house calls instead. Will they give me IV treatment at St. Clair's? Well, Mr. Finnerty, they usually don't do that in hospice. Um, as death approaches, experience shows that it's actually a little bit better to be dry. Patients just cough more when there's too much fluid. Well, what about today? Well, can't you just drink more salty um, fluids uh, like soup? Nothing staying down, Doc. Well, you are still dehydrated. Um, in fact, it was hard to tell how much his drop in blood pressure now upon rising from the bed was due to deconditioning and how much from dehydration. He had, in my judgment, taken to bed much earlier than he needed to. He had, it seemed, many acquaintances, but it was hard to tell if he had any close friends. I gradually learned that he had been estranged from quite a few members of his family. One of his cousins, a priest, had accused him of murdering his mother by not authorizing the use of a feeding tube when she was dying of Alzheimer's. He stated that he was close to a few nephews, but it seems this was itself a source of strain with their parents. He was a frequent AA sponsor, and some of his fellow alcoholics visited him as well. So... I guess we can give you normal saline by vein. I'll check with the nursing agency. But this is no substitute for that good old chicken soup. I want you to eat more and keep up with your fluids. So began a ritual of twice weekly normal saline infusions. Even when we had finally succeeded in controlling his nausea, he kept insisting on the saline infusions. From a purely biomedical point of view, I think these infusions were superfluous. From another point of view, however, they were grossly inadequate. I simply came to regard them as a kind of placebo that seemed to help him. A week later, I received a call. I think I'm dying. Okay, Mr. Finnerty, easy, easy now. Um, tell me what's bothering you. I got more pain in my shoulder, and I'm nauseous again, and my stomach hurts, and I ain't had a bowel movement in three days. Easy, easy, Mr. Finnerty. Has the nurse been in today? Not yet. Are you taking the Senecot? No, I thought I could just get by with the Colace. And what about the Tylenol number three? I don't want to. I'm an addict, you know. Mr. Finnerty, I, th uh, I think we can take care of this. I'll order the pain meds. You're not going to get addicted, and you're not going to be a martyr. Listen to me. I'll give you an enema, and we'll have some pain medication delivered, and you can start back on the Senecot. You need to keep taking that on Dancitron as well, and if that's not enough, I'm going to order a suppository for your nausea. You're going to be okay. You mean I'm not dying? Well, certainly not today. How do you know that? Well, because people who are dying usually aren't well enough to call their doctors on the phone to tell them that they're dying. <laughs> Every problem you have is fixable. Well, when then? Not today. What about St. Clair's? Well, I found out you're number two on the waiting list. 
That's kind of morbid, isn't it? <laughs> Waiting for people to die? Well, I'll, I'll give them a call, see what I can do. Can I have your beeper number? I, I mean, I won't abuse it or nothing. I just uh, want to have it in case I can't get you otherwise. Sure, Mr. Finnerty, sure. Uh, in total, um, I made ho five home visits. As much as I urged him to get up out of bed, I never found him anywhere else but in bed when I visited. The apartment was well lived in, filled with statues and pictures of saints. He had a book for reciting the prayers of the Liturgy of the Hours, something generally only used by priests, sisters, and brothers, at his bedside. His rosary beads were never far away. Most of the time he had them wrapped around his right hand. He was blessed with an exceptional cadre of nurses and home attendants. The attendants kept trying to get him to roll over and lay on his side to prevent bed sores, but he wasn't very compliant. They were all these young Mexican women and at least as pious as he was. They also made great chicken soup. I'm afraid I'm going to be damned, he said to me one day, his eyes again straining out of their sockets. Oh, you've received the sacrament of the sick and you've confessed, haven't you? Yeah, but I'm still afraid. Mr. Finnerty, you need to believe in your heart what you profess with your lips. I believe God loves you, don't you? I don't believe God wants you damned. What did he want from me? After all, I have to confess, I really did not like him. I would not, he would not have been my first choice for a drinking buddy. I didn't like the sound of his voice, but I especially didn't like his neediness. It was a really busy time for me with grant deadlines and writing assignments and speaking engagements. And every time I went away, I had to leave complicated instructions for him so that he could reach me if he needed me. In truth, he never once abused the privilege of having my beeper. But I hadn't given my beeper number uh, to a patient in years. Perhaps none had been as nervy enough as Fred to ask for it. Nor was I in the regular habit of making home visits. Home visits aren't easy to work into a physician's schedule these days. I figured out that the simplest way for me to do this was to see him first thing in the morning. I'd go to his apartment on my way to work. That way the whole thing could be accomplished in about 75 minutes, including the visit itself and the extra travel time to get to my uh, office at the hospital. I brought a medical student with me one day on a home visit. She had never seen a doctor make a home visit. The visits to Mr. Finnerty's apartment were at least somewhat helpful medically, um, but I could easily have relied upon the nurse's assessments without ever visiting. They were really excellent nurses, and they had extraordinary patience with him. When he demanded a special air-cushioned bed, and they tried to explain to him that his insurance wouldn't pay for it because he didn't have any bed sores, his primary nurse, Tom, dutifully called me, explaining to Mr. Finnerty that he didn't think that the chair of the ethics department would lie in order to get his patients the insurance coverage. Each visit with him was difficult to conclude. Since I was on his turf, I couldn't rely on the rattling sound of the chart of the next patient being placed in the slot on the door as a convenient prompt for me to suggest that the visit must draw to a close. That only works in the office. Mr. Finnerty loved especially talking about church gossip. Who would be the next Archbishop of New York? What did he think about bishops denying communion to Catholic politicians who, didn't, who supported abortion? One of the times I was out of town during the time I cared for him, it was to give a talk on, of all things, spirituality and health care. And as part of the workshop I did that time, I asked the participating physicians to spend 10 minutes thinking about just one patient. It's a useful exercise. It's often extremely difficult for a physician to do this, to think about just one patient. Studies have shown that even when the patient is present and starting to speak, physicians on average interrupt within 18 seconds. As a gesture of solidarity at this workshop, when I asked my colleagues to do this, 
um, I did the exercise myself as well. And on this occasion, not surprisingly, it was Mr. Finnerty who came into my meditation. Within a few main, uh, moments, my meditation had turned into a litany. I could see his face and I could hear his voice. And I prayed to myself, Lord, have mercy on Fred. Fred, have mercy on Fred. Lord, have mercy on Fred. Over and over. Although he was never exactly cheery, um, his mood gradually became bluer. I began to think that in retrospect, perhaps even his reluctance to get out of bed had probably been a sign of depression that I'd been overlooking all, all along. Do you think you might be depressed, I asked. I think I am, he replied. Have you ever been depressed before? Well, when my lover died 25 years ago, I got really bad. They put me on some medicine. Uh, do you remember what it was? It was too long ago, Dr. Salmacy. Now, it's always been a puzzle to me how it is that so very many gay people reconcile themselves to the church and its teachings um, and yet live lives that are often directly in violation of its teachings and yet are traditional and devotional in their religious practices. To inquire more about this um, would have been more than... Um, no more than mere curiosity on my part, and probably not helpful. Such a discussion might even be harmful now. Better to leave um, this to the mysteries that only God knows. I decided I wouldn't ask more. Don't ask, just serve. Probably a good policy. I simply prescribe some paroxetine. Since he lived alone and was fixed on the idea of going to this inpatient hospice, we had never applied for a home hospice program. Uh, we had decided that the regular home care nursing program would be good enough as a bridge to hospice. In fact, it was more than good enough. Eleven weeks after stopping the Tarsiva and having immediately made application to St. Clair's, he had still not been admitted to the hospice. Waiting times for inpatient hospices can be extraordinarily long in this country. Most of his best hospice time was spent playing the morbid game of waiting for other people to die. But in fact, I'd say he really had hospice without the name. The home care nurses who attended him were wonderful. His aides, that cadre of young Latinas, were strong and joyful, delightful and caring. He had had little pain through most of the course of his illness, he never did develop a bed sore despite his early trouble with diarrhea and the fact that he infrequently left the bed. But he had lost weight. His appetite remained poor. But he could still read the newspapers, pray the rosary, and tell people what to do. In examining him, he remained free of jaundice. His lungs remained clear. His liver was only mildly enlarged. One day, I felt a new right supraclavicular node. And with my fingers lingering there for just a fraction of a second uh, to confirm the finding, he felt me feeling it. What'd you find? Uh, a lymph node, Mr. Finnerty. That means I ain't got much time left, huh? Uh, I don't know that it means that. It does mean that the cancer is growing, but you didn't need me to tell you that. Does it mean it's going to go to my brain? No, I, I don't think so. Two weeks later, at the end of February, however, things suddenly did change. He began to complain of more pain in his shoulder and in his abdomen. Until this time, Tylenol number three had been sufficient. We now changed over to hydromorphone since he had some in the house. He called my office one morning and sounded a bit confused. The aides began to panic. I called and asked his nurse, Tom, to see him and let uh, me know what he thought. When he called, he said, I think he's dying, Dr. Salmacy. Well, then maybe we need to start a morphine drip. Um, he has that Heplock in place, so we can just hook him up. Oh, but it's Friday afternoon. The home infusion team is going to be tough to mobilize. Can he still take his pain medicines by mouth? I don't know. Let me see, uh, Tom replied. Maybe if I crush the hydromorphone and put it in some pudding, I can get him to take it. 
He called back a few minutes later to confirm that this had worked. Later, I spoke with the supervisor for the home care nursing team. You know, doctor, we need a plan for the weekend. I said, I'm, I'm with you. I was just going to sketch out a plan myself. Uh, the home IV infusion team had confirmed that they would not be able to start intravenous morphine until Monday. With the home health aides um, not legally authorized to give injections, subcutaneous morphine was out. And the smallest fentanyl patch available was probably still too potent given how little pain medicine he seemed to be requiring. The supervisor tried calling pharmacies and none of them stocked morphine or hydromorphine as suppositories. But she said, I'm an old hospice nurse and so is the nurse covering for the weekend. Um, we'll just take our, make our own suppositories out of crushed pills if he can't take the medicine by mouth. A deal, I said. I'm around all weekend, and I'll keep my beeper on, and I'll be certainly willing to sign the death certificate. I visited him for the last time that night. I needed a complex plan just to get to his apartment. See, I was scheduled to drive uh, out to Long Island for an overnight day of recollection with my local friar community at a small retreat place. Further, I had promised a young friar who had just started chemotherapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia at a nearby major cancer center that I would visit him that same night. And I also realized that I had left my cell phone at the friary and I wanted to have it with me while I was on retreat in case I was out walking if someone paged me about Fred. And, of course, they were predicting a big snowstorm. In the end, my plan was simple. I would go steadily north before heading east. Accordingly, my first stop was Fred's apartment. I parked illegally to save time, hoping I wouldn't get caught. I didn't bring my stethoscope. I didn't bring a prescription pad. One of the young Mexican girls answered the door. He just take the morphina, she said. Good, I answered. He was lying in bed, as always, the rosary beads wrapped around his right hand. The, quote, New York State out of hospital do not resuscitate order, unquote, form was clipped to the bedboard. I had helped him to fill it out. I knew it was the correct thing to do, yet now it seemed awkward and intrusive, almost a desecration. Mr. Finnerty, it's Dr. Solmacy. Are you doing okay? Are you comfortable? He opened his mouth, but he didn't speak. He raised his head for a few seconds, opened his eyes. Then he closed them again as his head fell back gently upon the pillow. He was breathing about 20 times a minute. His pulse wasn't palpable at the wrist, but as I touched his abdomen to be sure he wasn't in pain, I could feel his abdominal aorta. It was beating forcefully. The rate was probably 120. I didn't bother to count. His right leg was bent at the knee, raised up off the bed and trembling. I gently touched his knee and eased it back down. The aide positioned the pillow under his left leg so that his right ankle would rest upon it as well. Easy, Fred. I think you'll feel better this way. A mild look of strain then disappeared from his face, melting into the peace of the morphina. I held his hand and I prayed. It's time for night prayer, Fred. Protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep, that awake we may keep watch with Christ and asleep rest in his peace. Lord, now you let your servant go in accordance with your word. For with my own eyes I have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. May the all-powerful Lord grant us a restful night and a peaceful death. Good night, Fred. I turned to a young man who had been sitting silently in a chair in one corner of the room. His bare arms were heavily tattooed. 
One of those nephews, I thought. Maybe an alcoholic he'd sponsored at AA. I wasn't sure. I just said, it's good that you're here. Stay with him. And I left the apartment. Within a few moments, I found myself driving up to that cancer center to visit the young friar John, who had recently restarted the chemotherapy for his leukemia. And as the headlights rolled past on the opposite side of the highway, I began to feel like someone else was doing the driving. I was merely going along for the ride. I headed north into the darkness, vaguely conscious of the river to my right, vaguely conscious of my visit with Fred. And yet I couldn't avoid asking myself a new question. Why John? Or rather, I was asking God, why all these good, young, energetic, healthy friars? The shift from Fred to John felt like a film editor's splicing mistake. The scene had changed, but the scene was from another movie. And I was in both scenes in this strange supporting role. You see, another good, young, energetic friar from our province had recently been diagnosed with multiple myeloma. We were barely past the pain of that diagnosis when we had learned that Fred had leukemia. Don't you realize how strapped we are for vocations, Lord? How we're pulling out of our commitments to parishes and other places because we don't have enough friars? And then, so much for my theological sophistication, I thought to myself. But these sort of questions, in the end, can't be explained away by ratiocinations. I think they come from the lung, not the cerebral cortex. I wondered how John would really do. His prognosis was not very good. I wondered whether the time would come when my visits to John would become like my visits to Fred, the alpha and the omega of cancer treatment, all within a 90-minute span. Was this some avant-garde movie I was living? And as I continued driving up the highway towards the cancer center, I also remembered that I needed to go to the friary to pick up my cell phone, and I was fearful I might forget this task and just drive out to Long Island. Um, so I, uh, even after I reached the cancer center, I was reminding myself to remember. After all, I was still planning my usual walk along the beach the following morning, and I wanted to carry my beeper, and I wanted to have my cell phone with me. They might call about Fred while I was out walking and praying, Best to be prepared because it could happen at any time. Well, my geographic plan seemed to work. I visited John. I drove to the friary and picked up my cell phone. And then I drove out to Long Island to the retreat place at the beach. And I had beaten the snowstorm. Very efficient, just like a dock. Now, one of the friars with whom I lived had gone to the retreat house earlier in the day. And he'd prepared a late dinner for the two of us. It was a Friday in Lent, so we ate fish, sole stuffed with crab meat, hardly penitential. <laughs> we had a nice dinner. I said nothing about Fred, and I barely mentioned that I had seen John and that he was doing okay. We had a lively conversation that I found pleasantly distracting. Before we knew it, it was 11 p.m., so I washed the dishes, picked out one of the guest rooms, and prepared to go to bed. The snowstorm that had been predicted by the weather forecast never did arrive. In its place began a torrential, windswept rain, blown in off the ocean, beating with a rhythmic tapping against the northeast window of my room. No snow, no sleet, no winter lightning, just the rain. Charged my cell phone, placed my beeper on the nightstand next to the bed. I was waiting for the call. It might well come during the night. I would instruct the nurses and the family, bring a note of calm, and finally bring Fred's story to a close. Whatever he wanted from me, he seemed to want me to be with him to the end of this journey, and I was determined to see it through. I didn't use a prayer book that night. I was tired. So I just play, prayed the canticle of Simeon to myself, once more from memory. Night prayer again, this time for me. And I fell asleep. I awoke the next morning at 6.30 now in the grayness of a cloudy sunrise before my alarm went off. 
and I was seized by a sudden sense of panic. The rain was much softer, but it hadn't stopped. I never changed my beeper signal to, from vibrate to alarm, I thought to myself. What if it went off and I didn't hear it? I fumbled for my glasses and pressed the message button on the beeper. Urgent, 3.42 a.m. EST, it read. I pressed it again. Urgent, 3.35 a.m. EST. Shit. I, I shook the fogginess out of my head, rubbed the sleep from my eyes, reached for the phone, and dialed the callback number. A woman answered with a voice so cheerful that it jarred me. I began to mumble. I suspect you're the nurse who was covering for Mr. Finnerty over the weekend. I'm, I'm really sorry. You know, I, I woke up and realized you had paged me in the middle of the night. I'm really sorry. You know, I put my beeper on the nightstand next to the bed, and I forgot to turn it from vibrate to alarm. And uh, I said I'd be available day or night. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem, she said. And it dawned on me uh, that the cheeriness in her voice meant that she'd been up all night and hadn't gone to bed herself. I got through to the covering internist, Dr. Weinstein, and he took care of everything. He was really pleasant and cooperative. Mr. Finnerty's death was really very peaceful. Family and friends were there with him. It all went very smoothly. Now, the funeral parlor will call you on Monday to sign the death certificate. Oh, that's at least good to hear. Uh, thank you so much. Again, again, I'm sorry. Not a problem. It was a pleasure to care for him. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to bed. The showers were now alternating with hints of sun. I looked out the window and saw a small patch of blue amid the lessening gray. I knew that the rain would eventually stop and that I'd be able to get my walk on the beach in after all. The weather cleared and I did make it to the beach. I walked along the ocean for miles. The salt air and the sound of the waves seemed just right. But as I walked, I could not help thinking about Fred. Every once in a while, I stopped walking, turned away from the beach, and looked out at the wide, storm-stirred ocean, seemingly endless in its expanse. Myriads of sunbeams were striking the surface and dancing an angelic and brilliant ballet. You know, at such times, the ocean can seem infinite. Yet I knew it was not infinite. I could see the horizon, and horizons enclose us in the finite. Even this massive ocean, I thought, even this Atlantic Ocean was finite. Fred had demanded salt and water. But even the depths of this ocean would not have supplied enough saline for Fred. He so desperately needed the salt of the earth. If we could have infused all of the saline of all of the oceans in all of the world into his veins, it would not have been enough. I guess it will never be enough for any of us. I prayed that Fred's needs were now fulfilled, that all the neediness I saw in him and I knew I could never fulfill had now been fulfilled. I began to thank Fred now for all he had taught me about my own needs and about my own insufficiency. I began to sense too that I was somehow not alone I looked around and I couldn't see a soul, but I had the sense that I was not alone. Not now in my walking, not then, whenever I had visited Fred or seen him in my office or in the hospital. Had Fred ever seen the one who was with me? I wasn't sure, but I finally realized as I walked along the beach and prayed that it had not been me that Fred had been looking for all along. Not ever. Never. You see, each time he had asked me for something or asked anyone who cared for him for something, a sleeping pill, 
a hospital bed, an enema, an infusion of saline. He was really looking for something else. Had he noticed? I knew I had not noticed, at least not until this moment. You see, I had thought all along that Fred was looking for me with his pleading pleading eyes and plaintive voice. And I had quietly resented his calls because I knew that I could not meet his needs. But I saw it all differently then, at least at that moment, walking on the beach after the rain. The beach had been deserted all morning. It was cold and windy. The rain had only recently stopped, but as I walked further down the wet sand, I finally did see someone else, another crazy person who had sought out the solace at the beach in winter. Far up ahead, standing by a fire at the edge of the foamy waves, I saw the outlines of a man. The image was indistinct, but he was warming his hands over the fire. I wondered if Fred could see him now better than I could. The vision of the dead is sharper than the vision of the living, or so they say. And as I drew closer, I could make out his wading boots and his tackle. A surf caster, I thought, as I watched him toss his line into the sea. Smart guy, first on the beach. The fish are always more abundant after the rain. Did Fred see him too? I hoped he did. I smiled, looked at my watch, and realized it was getting late. I turned around and headed back down the beach toward the retreat house. The friars would be expecting me for midday prayers. Beautiful and profoundly moving. I, I hope it'll stimulate some comments or questions. Something so profound it's sometimes hard to know how to respond, but anyone? Um silence is okay too. <laughs> Is Fred a singular individual? Uh, yeah, I, yes, there's, uh, um, there's very little that's um, you know, been changed except names and such, but this was one patient, one patient, um, at least in the story. Whether Fred stands for more than that is another, que is another question. <laughs> yeah, is another question. Um, there's a way in which Fred is everyone, but is all patients, but um, the, the story is of one patient. Yes. I'm curious about the comment of the woman parking in the sea. Mm -hmm. It's trying to prophesize something about how they're going to get home from the sea. Why that? Um, I was probably um, um, inspired by, um, in some ways, by. Uh, the line from T.S. Eliot that the communication of the dead is tongued in fire beyond the language of the living. Um, and my um, experience was um, was a, a sort of more visual one, uh, I think, at that point, um, and um, understood, I think, the same phenomenon um, and used you know different language to capture it in uh, in my own uh, in my own experience. Um, um, and, um, you know, probably beyond that, um, I'll leave it to each person to, in, uh, to interpret it. Um, I think I have some sense for myself of what it means, but it's probably, um, um, as Wittgenstein might say, better g g g shown and not said. So. <laughs> yes, Jason, yeah.
Yeah, I think that's that's true. There's push and pull um, uh, uh, quite frequently um, as uh, as people are dying. Um, it's very, um, um, you know, it's it's common for people to um, have um, um, even suicidal thoughts as they're as they're dying. Um, but um, uh, most of the uh, most of the time, people are not suicidally depressed, but they um, are, you know, tired of the burden of disease, tired of the burden of what they've been um, uh, dealing with, um, and um, in, in some ways uh, longing for escape from that, um, and maybe, uh, maybe longing for the possibility of something beyond this. I mean, in, in, in old, older language, behind, you know, beyond this you know, veil of woe, um, uh, and there's an attraction uh, uh, to that. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, most of us experience life as good, and <laughs> we don't want to. We don't want to give it up, and we pull back from it. Um, and so I think that push-pull experience of dying um, is frequent and part of what Fred expressed. Again, like sort of lots of patients, if not every patient. Yes. Are you able to collaborate? Uh, yeah, in this case, um, you know, a lot of his spiritual care was given by um, directly by priests that he already uh, knew. Um, um, so they were uh, the pe persons who, for instance, visited him and gave him uh, the sacrament of the sick and uh, and uh, and all of that. Um, but uh, yes, in this case, since it wasn't um, you know formally. Um, hospice, there weren't chaplains who were part of the care team um, um, directly. Um, but that's when you, uh, when dealing with palliative care or hospice, that's part of what I was telling the students last night, that's part of the, the sort of lessons that hospice and palliative care can give to the rest of medicine, of the ability to care for patients as whole persons as part of a team in which the chaplains play an integral role in, uh, in doing that. Um, it was also um, uh, very clear um, that um, um, I um, avoided uh, the um, temptation for myself to become his um, uh, chaplain, right? I think that the um, role, uh, there are some things patients want to tell their chaplain or clergy, they don't want to tell their physicians and vice versa, and even if, you know, I had had more, you know, vastly more spiritual training than most physicians, um, it's not, um, I'm not advocating um, neo-shamanism in which the physician becomes the, you know, the guru or the, uh, or the priest for the, for the patient, that we work together as a team, um, um, and, but keep the roles somewhat separate as well. So I'm not advocating neo-shamanism. So. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is now um, two and a half years ago. Yeah. So we're closer to closer to three at this point. I guess we three yes, if, if we're in yeah it was February so it's three three years ago yeah yes well I you know I hope it has changed something of my interaction with Lots of uh, of other patients, particularly the ones you know, the psychiatrists will t tell physicians to pay attention to what uh, to what um, you're you're feeling because it um, um, you know has you know sig you know significant implications in the doctor patient relationship, and uh, to recognize when I get frustrated with patients who are really needy. Um, to recognize that it's not my job to fill all of their needs. Um, and that's very helpful because um, there are too many of us in medicine who you know, think it is our job to fulfill the needs of every 
single patient and we get frustrated when we can't do it and sometimes we try to short circuit things and use drugs when um, they're inappropriate because we you know that's what we do and we want to fix things um, and this was a sense in which um, I had to come to better terms you know, late in my career so for the younger people here maybe you can come to that uh, um, sort of realization earlier um, that the you know, as, as the theologian uh, Paul Ramsey once said, the function of medicine is not to relieve the human condition of the human condition, right? Um, and it's not my job to fulfill all the needs of every single uh, patient and to be comfortable with um, the limitations of the craft of medicine um, and my limitations as a, as a particular uh, uh, practitioner. Yes? Yeah, I can I can say that I I never liked him even to the end, um, but I did come to love him. <laughs> um, and there's a difference between those two, and I hope it was you know illustrated by the by the story. So, okay, good. Yes, in the back, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think it has, you know, has a lot to do with these sorts of, you know, limitations I was talking uh, talking about, you know, uh, uh, particularly for, you know, with all the many hats I tend to wear, I tended to, um, you know, have my, you know, think of myself as somebody who could come close to fulfilling um, all the needs of, of, of patients, um, um, and I had to come, uh, 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 come to better terms with that. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I came to understand some parts of, um, um, of scripture better, uh, through this, um, and, um, and understood, them, um, you know, there are cer certainly scriptural allusions throughout the, the text, um, uh, and that was sort of a combination of my own reflection on my experience and the uh, and the text of uh, um, of the uh, of the New Testament and sort of pulling those uh, pulling those together, um, um, it helped me um, in terms of um, you know, even in some ways some um, uh, theological uh, development um, and sort of well personal incorporation of theological development. The idea of horizons is very important in the theology of you know Karl Rahner, for instance, and and um, you know, experience, it's one thing to say it and write it in a, and read it in a theology text. Um, it's another thing to sort of um, experience it, you know, symbolically and meaningfully in the way, um, in the way that I did. Um, it was uh, eerie. I will tell you that, um, that Friar John died about uh, almost, well, he died in March. So it was about uh, close to a year, just over a year after um, uh, this experience with Fred, and um, it was my visiting um, John was very influenced by the connection I had already made um, to, um, uh, to to Fred, and then it um, just dawned on me that even in my own um, prayer life, while I had been um, very um, regular in praying for patients. Um, Perhaps the biggest thing uh, that uh, that I got out of this uh, was a new understanding of how much patients can teach me um, about um, medicine, about living, about um, um, about God. Um, and so, those are a few of the things maybe that uh, that I, you know, got th from it. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, when I think um, the question, if you didn't hear it, is uh, were there other non, you know, biomedical um, interventions that um, were particularly helpful for uh, for Fred? And the question in particular was about when uh, when I prayed with him. Um, that was the only time um, I prayed with him, and I think at that point, um, 
you know, if um, if he understood me, it was at a spiritual level, not at a con- <clears throat> not at a conscious level at that point. <clears throat> um, I think um, I think he was aware of my presence, um, and that was maybe the you know the the deep prayerful connection that I was able about to make. And beyond that, whether he knew that that presence had taken the form of the Canticle of Simeon. Um, I, I, I doubt, but I think that um, we were connected personally in ways that I couldn't see physical responses uh, to. Um, yeah, well, there are other <clears throat> non-medical things. You know, I think it's, you know, Woody Allen says, you know, half of life is showing up, right? So, you know, half of medicine is showing up, and I think the, the physical presence, you know, the making of the, um, of the house calls, um, when I said was not medically indicated in some ways. I could have done everything through the nurses. You know, my being there um, was um, important to him um, and I think um, valuable in a, um, in a way that you wouldn't get, um, you know, the outcomes measuring people wouldn't be able to capture. <laughs> um, um, so there were those things. I, I talked about the, the saline it's, uh, it, itself as being um, sort of a placebo. Um, one of the students yesterday kept talking about um, um, uh, the you know, placebo effects of, uh, of spirituality. Um, this is, I think that this, the, um, the placebo effect uh, here was deeper than the kind that you'd read about in a pharmacology textbook. Um, um, and, and I hope that's part of what um, this, the story conveys as, as well and, and, taught, and taught me too. So those are some of the, you know, the, the non-medical ways. Touch too, just, you know, just, the, just the value of touch was very important. Knowing the physical exam, that's another, um, another thing that um, I had never been aware before as acutely as I was of the way in which um, um, people pay, patients pay attention to what we're doing in the physical exam um, and that, um, you know, even if we're trying to be neutral, just even the extra time we could take feeling a lymph node that the patient could be conscious of that was something I had never learned uh, learned before. So I I learned more about the the sort of um, communicative value of touch, um, which I think most of the time was helpful uh, to Fred, of just listening to his lungs and the way in which that communicated something positive to him, but also the way in which it could be frightening, maybe going back to the push, push pull if, um, if he hears me, feel, felt me lingering for just a fraction of a second. Yes. I mean the use just the use of narrative yeah yeah, yeah. well I you know, I think it's more helpful um, in talking about spirituality you know so in um, there are stories like this um, in many of my you know spiritual uh, spirituality books it doesn't make it into the medical articles about which are more about spirituality than works of spirituality um, but in the books I have the you know the opportunity to talk about you know other patients who um, I uh, have, um, uh, with whom I've had the privilege of, of journeying um, through chronic illness or to, uh, or to death and the, and, the, and the meanings, the mutual meanings that are conveyed in that. And I think that um, the narrative form um, is able to capture these, uh, these sorts of um, aspects of meaning, value, and relationship um, that are critical to the practice of medicine, critical to the spirituality of being a practitioner um, um, in ways that I think are more successful than trying to just describe them. Well, I, this uh, yeah. We need to be mindful of people's time. I think we've learned a lot today, many important lessons, both from, uh, from Fred and Dr. Solmazy. So uh, let's thank them for being our speakers.